Hello, this is Stephanie. And this is Brian. Welcome to our podcast, The Making and the Remaking of a Codependent Mind. Today we're going to continue something we started in the first episode of this season and expand on this idea of emotional vulnerability. So what do we mean by emotional vulnerability? Yeah, what would be a basic definition that you're working with? Well, just the word vulnerability means being open to harm somehow. Kind okay. Of. It could be any kind of harm. And there's a lot of different kinds of vulnerability, but we're going to focus on emotional vulnerability here. Because it's the one we see as connected to intimacy. Yeah, right. So in order to have intimacy in, the, in a relationship, there's going to be emotional vulnerability because yeah. there's going to be the possibility of harm. You're letting someone know you. And when we say intimacy, we're talking about emotional Im- intimacy. When So when we did that episode, we were kind of talked about the different kinds of intimacy also, and emotional intimacy being the one where we really are going for getting to know each other deeply. And so vulnerability is kind of like the vehicle for that. And vulnerability, emotional vulnerability, isn't just a challenge for people who struggle with codependency, obviously. Mm-hmm. We all find it challenging to be emotionally vulnerable to people, to open ourselves up to harm. But I do think there's particular challenges for people who have codependent behaviors. When, when thinking about this topic, this seemed like a, yet another one of these underlying problems for, with codependent behaviors, kind of like an overarching problem to where I feel like codependency is the exact opposite of vulnerability in many ways. Because codependent behaviors are designed to protect you and to keep you safe. So they're, they're a hedge against vulnerability. Yeah, exactly. Right. Because you're afraid to open up because you've developed these things to keep yourself safe at some point And then it became maladaptive. Interestingly, human babies, human infants, human children are among the most helpless and vulnerable in the whole animal kingdom. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you think of other examples of baby animals baby horses can stand up almost immediately Mm -hmm. after birth they can run so they so they have some way to protect themselves baby monkeys so primates are very close to humans species but baby monkeys can cling to their mothers human infants can do nothing yeah just lay there basically (laughs) yeah i mean they can look cute (laughs) yeah (laughs) so that human adults are like oh i take care of this thing and then they can cry and if those two things don't work. They're kind of screwed. Yeah. I watched an experiment called the still face experiment. Mm-hmm. I can put a link in the show notes or you can Google it. It's on YouTube. And it's an experiment that I guess has been replicated over and over again with um, very similar results in, in different cultures as well. They have a baby, a human baby, an infant, somewhere between three to six months sitting in a chair, or, you know, strapped in their high chair or something. And, and then the mother is interacting with the baby the way that you see mothers do and the way that you hope mothers do, being very responsive and the baby is trying to verbalize, making sounds, and the mother responds with her own words as if the baby's talking and Mm. the baby will point and the mother will look, oh, what are you pointing at? Oh, that's what this is. And the baby will clap their hands and the mother will, will... will reciprocate and you know it's kind of what we were talking about earlier this kind of babies learning how to co-regulate their Mm -hmm. emotions by by interacting with their caregivers so that happens for a few minutes and then the mother looks away and then when she looks back her face is perfectly still it's demonstrating no emotion and she makes no physical reaction to the baby and the baby is initially kind of just startled and confused and starts to do the things that, you know, a minute ago were working to engage the mother, uh, clapping and pointing and, and looking cute, right? And then starts to get very distressed and upset and starts to arch its back. And because the mother continues with the straight face. The mother continues with the st- still face. And, and this is, you know, under a minute or, you know, maximum two minutes to the time where the baby is wailing, <laughs> really, really upset. And so then the mother re-engages and the baby kind of calms down, although it's still a little wary. Yeah, because what just happened? They, what just happened, right? And, and it's just real. it's really hard to watch, actually, <laughs> because it just, again, highlights how vulnerable we are as babies and how critical that connection is. And when that connection is removed, Mm. how distressing and upsetting and terrifying it is. And I quoted Gabor Matei in the last episode, I think, when I said, 
one of his sayings that I like is, you don't need drama for trauma. So this is not a situation <laughs> that you would cue as, oh, that's a traumatic event. But yeah. clearly it was becoming a traumatic event for, right. the, for that baby. And if it happened repeatedly, again, maybe not even through any fault of the caregiver. You could have an overwhelmed caregiver. You could have an absent caregiver because of you know poverty or war or violence in the home. So the, if the baby is repeatedly making bids for connection and it's, it's not being responded to, you would get this kind of sense of, crap, like, now what? Now right. <laughs> what do I do? Yeah, and then the baby has to adapt somehow. Yeah. And, and, and it's it, going to adapt somehow. Right. And it made me think, actually, of your possible infant home, which we assume is similar to your home when you were three and four and five, when yeah. you started to remember and understand, right? where you seem to have both parents is kind of overwhelmed. Yeah. And, and, and it's not just what I remember experiencing when I was old enough to remember form memories, but it's also evidence from what my mother told me, where she, she has told me this on a pretty good regular basis. And you've heard her say this, mm -hmm. where she talked about how I was a difficult child. And uh, I cried a lot. Right. So a difficult baby even. It yeah, difficult even baby. before you were, right. Right. So there clearly is temperaments in humans that sure. may start from birth, but that's not always the reason why a baby is crying. <laughs> I mean, sometimes a baby's crying because they are making one of these bids and it's not being responded to. Their, and, needs, their needs aren't being met. And again, that's so distressing. Yeah. And, and, and I kind of have a feeling from based on just the evidence I could put together that, yeah, my mom I was, was just overwhelmed and didn't know how to respond to it. And she even told me things like, she went to the doctor to ask, what do I do? How do I stop him from crying? Which is kind of, I think, a lot of people's, that, that just like, I need, to, I need to make this baby stop crying somehow. Right. He suggested throwing water on me. <laughs> she didn't do it. <laughs> he suggested traumatizing. Yeah, right. <laughs> Can you imagine? I mean, that's kind of actually kind of similar to what a lot of adults do. Do this shut up, you know, like mm -hmm. this kind of violent stop crying stance. So your mother had two babies mm -hmm. under two. Your brother's less than two years older yeah. than you. She had a husband who, as we've talked about, had emotional regulation issues, yeah. uh, particularly angry outbursts. She had no family around her. She was somewhat isolated in the home. And it sounds like she really struggled to meet your needs as a baby. Yeah. And I even had evidence, too, that it was kind of expected that she do most of that work, the caregiving work. And I think my dad did have family nearby and friends would come over and things like that. And she was always expected to kind of entertain and cook and also take care of us and things like that. So yeah, it was probably very overwhelming, especially once she had two and I was the second. So you had that dynamic potentially with your mother struggling to, to meet your needs for care and attention and safety. And then you had your father potentially either kind of largely absent from the caregiving situation or having angry outbursts and, and demonstrating impatience, mm -hmm. demonstrating that he was not a safe option yeah. for care and safety. So like we've talked about, it's not surprising that by the time you got to the G relationship, you had developed a lot of these codependent behaviors mm -hmm. yeah. to try to either repress any needs that you had. Yeah, I think so. Right. And to try to placate or comply with more powerful people. Yeah other people's needs right since mm -hmm. mine weren't being validated and people like my dad were actually doing the opposite and appealing for me to validate his mm -hmm. there's where it starts and then i meet g and it's it's like oh here's somebody doing that same thing even on a more extreme level but yeah oh okay yep here i am at, at school for the first time because i met him in kindergarten and this is how i need to act with people my age too so you were potentially taught almost from birth that it was not safe to be emotionally vulnerable yep. and then that was reinforced repeatedly through your childhood in the relationship with g and from the home dynamic we talked about a couple of weeks ago i think too that you asked me when was the last time you cried like really cried where out loud and i said i when i was a baby i think right so I think that was another thing that I just removed. Okay, I can't, that's not available to me. They were trying to make me stop rather than trying to figure out why I was crying. And then people like G and then later on your abusive relationships, you would get attacked for crying. Yeah, right. Any any sign of emotional vulnerability mm -hmm. would be taken advantage of. Right. So like when I used to get injured on the playground, which happened on almost a daily basis, doing these tricks on the bars and things like that with G, the way it would usually go is I would probably pass out cold. I remember passing out cold. I would be passed out for maybe a minute or two. And then I come to and my first reaction is I see a couple of people standing around and that 
sympathy makes me start to tear up. Mm -hmm. He sees me start to tear up. He laughs. He walks away. So that was that was the response to my best friend seeing me crying was laughing and walking away. So it, it is the case often that when we're hurt and we see other people, there can be a variety of reactions, including feeling comfortable enough to say that you're hurt. But I think what you start to associate that feeling with people seeing you as vulnerable, people seeing you as hurt, you start to associate that with shame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Because there's something wrong. I'm not supposed to be expressing this or I'm not supposed to be feeling it even. Much like, as you're saying, your mom struggled to deal with whatever you were feeling, whatever you were needing when you were young, because it was too much for her. Well, and I think she had similar difficulties in feeling and expressing her emotions herself too. Sure. So this yeah. is just a mirror of that too. Yeah. But, you know, in terms of her language, you know, you were a difficult child. Not yeah. that she was overwhelmed or she had, you know, it was hard for her. That There was something that about her or that she was doing. It was something about you, it was something intrinsic mm -hmm. to you mm -hmm. that was wrong. And this is one of the reasons why I haven't really tried in recent days to have more conversations about these things. Because when I... With when the parents. two of us, with my parents, yeah, when the two of us first started discussing the things and really started learning things, we were pretty well into it. And I made another attempt at some point to talk to my parents. They were both sitting there. And my mom kept going to these go-tos. She had these go-tos that were sort of like that. Yeah, like, uh, well, you did this, mm -hmm. you know. I wasn't even saying anything about them, anything bad about them. I was saying something bad. I was talking about myself. Your experience. My experience. And it was just like, well, yeah, remember that time you lied about smoking? She would go into these old go-tos. It was just bizarre. You know, she was just carrying these things and she sensed that I was getting too vulnerable or something. And it just... Or she was feeling some amount of shame. Yeah, like right. Maybe she, was she, probably... she recognizes somewhere buried, compartmentalized within herself about the ways in which she perhaps didn't be the mother that she would have preferred to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just kind of recognize, okay, I mean, I could probably try again sometime, but I just... They didn't seem anywhere near receptive to that kind of stuff. So it certainly has to be the case, I think, that if you lead with vulnerability, the other person needs to respond. Yes. With equal vulnerability. Yes, exactly. Right. So you developed these codependent habits to protect yourself against emotional harm and physical harm as well from, from G, but certainly emotional and psychological harm. And that was a good idea. You needed to be protected from emotional harm because it was being done to you. But then, as we've said, you carry those habits forward and it makes it that much more difficult to establish intimate relationships because you're not comfortable, understandably, <laughs> being vulnerable. Yeah, I really, it's, it's as though I didn't really trust anyone. I, I went into every interaction assuming that I needed to protect myself and I'd be listening for cues. And some of those cues were either correct, someone was being abusive, or they were incorrect, somebody wasn't being abusive, but it, it triggered my trauma response that made me think it was unsafe. But either way, my response was codependent behaviors. So let's talk about some of your early attempts at vulnerability and intimacy, because yeah. you've said that you've always wanted that in your life, and I think everyone does. That's yeah, just right. a basic human need right? I think to, so too. to feel connected. And, and you certainly um, try to have that with your friend, your 10-year friendship with E. Yep. How, yeah. did, how did that go? What were the problems there? Um, well, neither one of us were good at it, and we kind of stumbled into it, right? When we, we met initially in high school, and we definitely didn't have that type of relationship in the beginning, and we had one other friend, and it was a trio, and, and it was kind of just this chaotic friendship between the three of us. And eventually it became the two of us, and both of us started sinking into these habits of self-loathing and and fear of other people and things and so i've I've talked about how we mm -hmm. sort of got this lean on each other and as these problems started to develop within each of us and between the each of us we started opening up to each other but it still wasn't really very self-aware because neither of us neither of us really knew much about ourselves or what was causing any of this stuff but we made attempts to try to understand it and we made attempts at telling each other things about ourselves private things that you normally neither one of us had done before with anyone to anyone right and you and you've said that that felt good that it felt did. like something that you wanted yeah and i can clearly remember when i think back to it the motivation being i want this guy to know more about me mm -hmm. and i want to know more about him when he tells me things i enjoy that and and i feel like that makes us closer and i want to reciprocate then that friendship kind of ended in that he fell more into struggles with mental health and and alcohol mm -hmm. and then you went to you had a couple rounds of AA, which maybe taught you some not very good lessons about vulnerability. Well, because that was, uh, 
was all about just dumping kind of. That's really where I think I learned to just dump every thought, no matter how unformed it was, like kind of like confessional style. It seems like it it's encouraging yeah. vulnerability. Sounds but, like a good idea. But it almost comes off as, you mentioned the word confessional, but almost kind of sometimes a bragging confessional, right? Oh, yeah, right, like, yeah. Or, well, often like it who, seems like... Who can say the most shameful thing about yes, themselves? Yes, exactly. Yeah, it did seem like people were trying to outdo each other sometimes with, with this stuff. We weren't, from what I remember, a lot of people, they weren't necessarily asking each other these things. They didn't necessarily... Because a lot of these, these were just strangers for mm-hmm. the most part. Right. You know, there were a couple of people that I met became more friends. But for the most part, I'm just sitting in a room with people and I'm saying stuff that I would say to someone, only to someone that I really wanted to get to know and let in. But I'm just saying this to a group of 15 people. Like, all right, everyone, here's a bunch of private things about me because that's what we're doing. And then you go on your way. So it it is kind of interesting that it, it wants to provide a safe space from emotional harm so that you can say these things, which is positive, right? Mm-hmm. But you're not really learning how to do that out in the wild. <laughs> you're just doing it in this con- this kind of very artificial context of saying these things to people, as you said, that you don't know, that you're not in a relationship with, and then right. leaving and, and, and not really kind of dealing with the consequences of what you said or what mm-hmm. you heard. If you need more intimacy and vulnerability, probably going to a meeting with strangers w- once a week and dumping and hearing what they're dumping is not going to get you there. Yeah, for one thing, it wasn't it wasn't actually exchanging these things with any one in particular. It would be different if maybe there was, and and like I said, I'd had a couple of friends and maybe even my sponsor, where I'm kind of more exchanging these things. So that, that resembled a little more closely to what we're talking about when it's it's this emotional intimate exchange. But just going there and saying this stuff, someone else says something, and then we all go out our ways. Yeah, and like you said, there's no feedback. There's no there's no potential consequences of it. Someone may be thinking something of me, and they may want to say something, but they can't because we're not supposed to actually talk. They call it cross talk. And you know, oh, there, interesting. There may be some meetings where they allow that, but when someone's talking, you're not supposed to interrupt them. Right. So that's not how it goes in the larger world. Yeah. But again, it might be a good first step. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not like it's just a terrible thing or something. I mean, it it, it can be helpful. Could be helpful for them as a stepping stone, maybe to okay, I can. I think I can feel comfortable pursuing this in real life, intimacy in real life. So then we get to the R and J relationships and what it attempts at establishing intimacy look like there and getting to know them and letting them getting to know you. For when I've reflected on when I think about the R relationship, I very quickly deteriorated from intimacy. And I remember for the first year, at least, constantly making comparisons to my friendship with E, which was directly before that relationship, going, this doesn't feel the same. This doesn't feel right. That's not what I was working towards. Mm -hmm. But then eventually it just eroded so much. And then I completely forgot about what intimacy meant and what it felt like. At the beginning of that relationship, were there attempts to be vulnerable? I mean, really, my attempts were because I had actually the E relationship didn't go Come clearly up to the art. I had this buffer of AA in between. Mm-hmm. So I was learning this data dump thing. And I did that when I met R. And I just did it whether she asked for it or not, because that's what I was used to doing. On hindsight, so many of those things that I told her were the things that she used to kind of construct this way to get control over me. To cause you emotional harm. Yeah, because so she was made- looking for that stuff. She needed that stuff to, oh, she needed to be better than everyone she encountered. And was that a similar dynamic with Jay? Or yeah. did, you, did you learn your lesson? Did you do less of that? Was, was uh, there even less vulnerability? As no, a, not at all. Mm. No. I, I, you didn't learn your lesson? No, I didn't learn. Well, yeah. I mean, how could I? I just, p- part of my problem was I, ne- I, I couldn't think about anything big picture. So there's, there's no way I was going to learn lessons okay. within that atmosphere. I, mm-hmm. I was in a permanent triggered state, mm-hmm. which meant that really my world was small. Very, I had no self-awareness. I, I avoided self-awareness because it caused too much shame and fear to know too much about myself and have wants and needs and desires and stuff like that. And this leads to, of course, this idea of just lining up with people, which is what I did, because that's what I trained myself to do. Ah, I'm, I'm in an unsafe situation here. I actually am in an unsafe situation here, but my reaction to it is to line up with the other person rather than get out. That's how you become less vulnerable, is you're almost like right next to them, mm-hmm. lockstep. Wherever they go, you follow. Whatever they want to do, I do. See, and I had all the emotional gymnastics that I did to make that okay. So I didn't feel too much shame from doing that, like the compartmentalization and 
and post hoc rationalization. And I, I was very good at this rationalization. So then when we get to our relationship, you really are not comfortable with being vulnerable yeah. with me, which is not something I really picked up on <laughs> early on. Right. I think in part because you are very good at lining up and matching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when I would be vulnerable to you, you would respond in a very kind of loving way, right? I, mm -hmm. I, I never, well, not never. I mean, not all. Occasionally yeah, right. it didn't go well. You know, if I was being vulnerable and it triggered you. Yeah, if it implicated me or triggered right. me. Right. Then we would have problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Severe problems. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, you know, so if I was being vulnerable in terms of my initially my kind of confusion about the J relationship mm -hmm. and what that meant in terms of how we interacted, those were sources of some initial harms to me because you would you protected that relationship mm -hmm. and your vision of it to protect yourself and the shame from it rather than respond to my vulnerability in, in an honest and vulnerable way yourself. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was echoes of what happened when I was actually in those relationships. I need to have this feeling as though I'm here for a reason and and I'm trying to make this thing work. It may have some problems here and there, but rather than the reality, which is these were just toxic to the core. Those and that you were afraid and anxious and depressed. For yeah, and I couldn't it. even admit those things. You right? couldn't I couldn't admit things. that I was afraid. That was something that I still, even now, I, may, I make the mistake of thinking as though I admitted that, that I was afraid of. And, but no, I never did. Even well after. Yeah, well after. Because mm -hmm. that would have been easier to admit than that I was, that I had shame, because that's sort of a more, a concept that I had to really kind of learn more about and what it felt like. But fear is a pretty easy one to spot, but still not when I'm suppressing my emotions. So we had two problems. And again, it's not like I find vulnerability easy, for sure. Right. It's scary. It's scary. So I, I'm not saying I'm an expert at it. I'm just saying... Mm -hmm because of your past and the codependent code behaviors, it was more of an issue yeah. with you. And the, it had kind of two dimensions. One being that you were very scared to do so, understandably again. And then you, because of this fear, at this point, it became almost habitual not yeah. to be vulnerable. Yeah. To, the first instinct was to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, always. So you could match my vulnerability if it, if it didn't trigger you, mm -hmm. right? So I say I love you and you said I love you back <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. but then if I say like okay well you say you love me and you told Jay you loved her I mean what does that mean mm -hmm. how, how do you reconcile that then that would be <laughs> yeah. triggering and you could not go there at first mm -hmm. so there was that the kind of habitual reflexive I can't be vulnerable if, if there's any perceived threat or possibility of threat mm -hmm. and then the second part is what you were just saying you also didn't really know yourself. So one of the primary ways of being vulnerable emotionally is to say, I want this. I need this. Yeah. I care about this thing. This thing causes me fear or this thing causes me confusion. And you didn't really have a handle on any of those emotions. So it was really hard for you to express it. Right. And I, and I had been lining myself up with people for so long that it was difficult for me to, to really nail down who I even was as far as my wants and desires went. I had to do some work, and we had a discussion about this recently, to really think about overall what I really did like and dislike. Because, and want and yeah. not want and desire and not desire. Yeah, and because so, in some ways it was a, it's kind of a mystery still. Oh, I used to do this particular thing a lot, and now I don't anymore. Why is that? Why did that just drop off all of a sudden? Is it because I'm lining up with you and I don't want to do that because you don't like to do it or something? It's... And particularly within relationships. I yeah. mean, that was the most important to me. What do you want from a partner? What do you desire? What do you need? What are the most important ones among those things? What are the things you were willing to compromise on? Yeah, I did a, I, a while back, I did a, a, a big exercise on that, that I need to read back through again at some point. I think you read it kind of recently, this once needs desires. Doc. I was very proud of that at the time. I felt it felt very good and it felt very honest and, and complete. But as with a lot of things I've written, I could probably rewrite it again now and it might be different. Sure. I mean, I think we could all rewrite our wants and needs and desires. Yeah. We, those, you know, that makes sense that those things are changing as you learn about yourself. Mm -hmm. You bring that up. I'll just mention, uh, maybe we'll put that in the Patreon as oh, yeah. bonus material, your your write-up of your wants and needs and desires mm -hmm. so people can see how you you took a took a stab on that. And it was very helpful for both of our, for both of us, I think, in terms of me being more reassured yeah. 
that exercise was helpful to me to see it written down and know that you spent a lot of time. So the Patreon ag- account, again, if you haven't heard us talk about it, we set up a Patreon account where you can join the Codependent Mind community. Uh, there's going to be bonus material and show notes for each of the episodes. And you can find it by going to the link in the show notes for this episode or by going to patreon.com and searching a codependent mind. So that's an ongoing thing is learning about and expressing your needs, wants, and desires. Yeah, make, making sure I'm being an individual. And that you know yourself. And, and that's yeah. you've made huge yes. gains in knowing yourself. Absolutely. But there's still the, the habit. We always come back to this. Codependent behaviors are habitual behaviors mm-hmm. and habits are hard to break. Yeah. Your habit of agreements, compliance, or lining up. Right still shows up kind of almost, I mean, maybe not daily, but weekly, even yeah. there'll be episodes. Right. So this, I mean, last week we had two examples of this when we were going on our walks. Mm-hmm. And this comes down to really, I may have a, just a half formed idea about something and I, I say it and then you disagree with it. Well, I think this, and, and then I may go, Oh yeah, that's a, that's a better idea. And that happens all the time and it's fine to change my mind and but what was happening last week in one of these cases is not that. It was the habitual st- style of lining up where we were having a conversation and I gave an opinion on something. And the minute, like the moment you started talking, I detected your tone mm-hmm. and I back- backpedaled immediately before I even heard anything of what you were going to say. So it was like, oh, no, well, well, yeah, no, I mean, it could be, you know, so I have no idea what you're going to say. I have no idea with you if you're going to disagree with me or what, but it's like this, uh-oh. I think she's disagreeing with me here. I better preemptively say, oh, well, yeah, your your point is valid too. Right. And and sometimes it's wrong. I mean, I, yeah. right. There's no tone there. I'm just going to say something. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, one of the example you mentioned, we were going on a walk and you, and you said, let's turn down this alley. And we turned down the alley and I went to say something. I don't even know if it was about the alley. And you're yeah. like, oh, or we could go back yeah. and go the, the other way. And I'm like, oh, no, this is fine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So, yeah, it's just still feeling comfortable with any kind of disagreement or discrepancy between you and someone else yeah. is still challenging for you. So this is this is when we talk about language with, you know, I have to watch my language with things like using we too much and things like that. This is one that's also kind of language, but even more behavior than language. Well, it just indicates there are still a lot... Behind the behavior, behind the language, the linguistic behavior, there's still these emotions that are habitual emotional responses to these situations, which are someone's going to disagree with you or someone's going to see that you're making a demand on them. And making a demand is making yourself vulnerable because they might respond or they have responded in the past to demands with anger or with shame or with violence even. Having boundaries is, is being vulnerable. Yes, it is, actually. That's true. And especially when, when those boundaries are crossed. Because I had a fear, and that's why I didn't have boundaries. Because I didn't want to have the potential of my boundaries being crossed. This is kind of where the habitual powerlessness comes in, too, though. So I kind of assumed that I had to line up with the other person also. Because of this, this chronic powerlessness problem. Um, I didn't think I had the ability to do anything if say my boundaries were crossed or if I even had a disagreement with somebody or if, if they said something I didn't like or didn't agree with, I didn't trust myself enough to respond to that in a way that that was true to myself. You had to give that up as a small child. You had to give up that ability, that trust in yourself, that authenticity in order to get the treatment and the care that you legitimately needed when you were a small child. Yeah, actually, and this reminds me, I think we may have mentioned it in an episode, maybe not, but where I, it w- I was consistently told I shouldn't argue. And so this was another just piece in the puzzle of mm-hmm. when I had disagreements, maybe I didn't do it well. If it goes too far down the road of maybe being negatively emotion, negative emotions involved or something like that, where you're angry at each other or something like that, that might not be so enjoyable. But I think my go-to was that it was always going to go that direction. But Well, in part, if you were told... Repeatedly as a child, don't argue don't or, argue. or yeah. you know, you, you described your father if you questioned right, we did his, talk about that. Yes. his orders, essentially, you, he would get even more to shut up and do it kind of thing. Yeah. So you, you never learned, not only did you, were you taught that you had to agree mm-hmm. and that you could get 
violence directed at you if you didn't agree, verbal violence or, or other kinds. You also never got to experiment with disagreeing. Yeah, right. So you never learned how to get comfortable in conflicted discussions. Yeah, I wasn't good at it. I never, I, yeah. I because didn't you get, never got to practice. Yeah, and I, I think this is practice. true for a lot of people who actually kind of ironically grow up in high conflict homes. They never, it either has to be no conflict or high conflict. Yeah, they yeah. don't know this in between where you can just, you can disagree with someone and it's okay. <laughs> and yeah. you can't even have raised voices and it, it's okay. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that violence is imminent or yeah, right. a breakdown of the whole social order is imminent. Yeah, it just means people are expressing their emotions, what they're feeling. And they're being vulnerable when they're expressing their emotions. So something that I think some of the give and take with vulnerability isn't just what I'm revealing about myself. It's inviting you to reveal things about yourself. And that takes a certain amount of active curiosity. And I think we may have talked about this a little bit, but I struggled in that area and I still struggle in that area of active curiosity where I'm pressing you and challenging you to be, to reveal yourself. And it also may be that you don't really know how to create a safe space for me to be vulnerable in Mm -hmm. because again, you really haven't had practice providing that to other people. Because as I said, it's not as if it's easy for me to be vulnerable. And it is, I think this, it needs to be this kind of exchange of vulnerability. So me just telling you everything about myself, that's extra vulnerability. Because I'm, I mean, you may not even care, right? I mean, yeah, so right. I'm, I'm not like, Jay, you describe your former partner as this verbal dumping. Mm-hmm. She didn't really care whether you were interested or not, I know, right? I know. She just felt entitled to, to be listened to. Well, I don't feel entitled to be listened to. I only want to tell things about myself to people who are interested in hearing it. So I only want to make myself vulnerable to people in that way who are going to be receptive. And one way to signal to me that it's okay to be vulnerable is for you to ask about certain parts of my life and my inner life. Yeah. And in that way to say, yes, I'm a safe person to talk to about X, X, and X, because I'm asking you about them. I'm inviting you. Right. And, and it, it, it makes sense. I've had to do a lot of thinking about where that impulse came from to not pursue, to not ask questions. I mean, part of the, of course, not challenging you is the lining up and the reflexive mm-hmm. uh, codependent behaviors. But then there's also this self-centered aspect of it. The, the fact that I was always in self-preservation mode. I was habitually avoiding empathy kind of where I was always probing for how I was implicated in things. And then I think when asking questions, a lot of times it felt unsafe because how is your response going to implicate me? Is it, it, is it going to require some kind of action on my part? Or are you going to say something that then triggers shame in me? Or are you going to ask the same question back to me? Am I, can I answer this question if you ask me? The kind of question and answer dynamic has, can have vulnerability built into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and so that's that's equally vulnerable, I think, to to do to ask people questions. It can as, be as it is to reveal just reveal things about yourself. It can, it can be. I mean, some people use it as a, as a hedge against vulnerability. They that's don't want to talk about themselves, so they just ask questions. But if they're if it's questions that you, as you said, can implicate you, certainly there's a, there's vulnerability in it. Mm-hmm. So it's an it's an ongoing challenge for both of us. But we wanted to discuss it because it's such a critical foundational behavior for intimate relationships is this exchange of vulnerability and this willingness to be vulnerable and this treatment of the other person's vulnerability with respect and with concern. Yeah. So it's, it's a, it's a good goal for any couple to have, to try to have a strong intimate connection, but it just so happens to also be a really great benchmark for how I'm doing with my codependent (laughs) habitual behaviors too. And it's again, one of the things that's very upsetting about the codependent habits when they linger, is that, as you're saying, they're, they're really, all the codependent behaviors are this kind of huge defense against vulnerability. Oh, yeah. But vulnerability is what you need to make these connections that are going to help you heal. So, yeah, if you want to read more about some of the challenges I've had and, and thoughts I've had on this subject of vulnerability, we'll be posting the show notes of this episode in, in Patreon. Um, and we'd love to have you on there. Thanks, as always, for listening. And And you can reach us on Instagram or Facebook at A Codependent Mind. Our Gmail is codependentmind at gmail.com. Thanks.